Hello and welcome back to another YouTube video. Today I'm going to be talking about how to buy film cameras. It might seem really easy, you can just go onto eBay and type film camera, buy the cheapest one, but it's not always that simple. Today I'm going to be talking about the entire process of finding the camera you want, finding how much it's worth or how much you should pay for it, going through the different options that you can have, I mean, be it a shop, um, a person-to-person -person sale, eBay, international eBay, all that sort of weird online marketplace stuff. And hopefully by the end, you're gonna know the, the pitfalls, the dangers, where the scams are. And if you watch this and you've never bought a camera before, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the process of buying a Canon AE one. Now, I'm not actually gonna buy one, I have one right here, but what I'm gonna do is talk through the entire process from choosing the camera you want to buying and receiving the camera that you're spending your money on. First things first, there are a lot of different film cameras out there. You might think that it's one monolithic market and all film cameras are the same, but obviously there are medium format cameras, point and shoot cameras, large format, panoramic, sub-miniature. I mean, there's a lot to choose from and you don't just wanna rush in to the film camera shop and say, give me one film camera. You wanna do a little bit of research and it is worth really knowing what you want. This actually leads into one of the first pitfalls, which is shops that you go in, you ask for a film camera, and they sell you something which is kind of adjacent to the good models. Maybe you go in looking for one of these shiny cannons, and they'll give you a Chinon or a Practica or something that kind of looks the part, but maybe isn't quite as well-made or well-suited to your photographic needs. This is a great example of a kind of beginner, but fully capable camera that you could go out and get and if you're looking for something similar, then watch along and essentially substitute the camera of your choice into this. I'm not gonna tell you all the cameras you should get because there are thousands of them. What I'm gonna do is tell you how to get this specific one and you'll work out the rest. One of the most important things to do before you even start looking at the shops is to get a good price anchor in your head. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump into a screen capture and I'm gonna show you how to get an accurate valuation any piece of equipment that you're looking to buy. So let's jump into that now. So what I'll do now is I'll search for the Canon A1 program. Let's see what we get. So I'm gonna click sold listings down here on the left. And what this is gonna do is sort by recent first and show me all of the listings for these cameras that have sold. So you can see that one of them's even sold today. We've got a few on the fifth. Anyone can go on eBay and list something for a thousand pounds. But these ones have actually been bought by real people. So you know that they're kind of trustworthy prices 140 155 I mean that seems a little bit high let's see what we can get 130 okay I mean these are all in the UK so I think that around 130 pounds seems to be the uh, the base going rate for a good condition Canon AE one I'm also seeing some around I mean there's one for 76 there 98 the, these are these are bids, so it seems like if you want to do a buy it now, you're going to pay about thirty pounds more. But maybe it's closer to ninety to hundred if you do auction it. Look at that fifty-three pound one for the Japanese black in the in the middle of the screen. Now that is a great deal. It has got forty pounds postage, but the ones in black are usually a bit more expensive. Okay, so once you've got your eBay valuation, you know the sort of the average or reasonable market price for the camera, and bear in mind that that will be specific to your market. If you live in the UK, as I do, then this 120 pound give or take figure is about right for a Canon AE one. But if you live in America, it might be different. If you live in Japan, it will probably be lower. There are different import duties, stuff like that. We'll talk about it later. But once you have that price in your head, you've got to also think about how much value you place on things like warranties or guarantees or even return policies. There are a few different ways you can buy a camera. I mean, the obvious and maybe the, the scariest one is going on something like Craigslist and just seeing what is, uh, oh, here we go, Canon A1 for sale, 50 pounds, don't know if it works, um, not tested. That would be an example of a good deal, but is it a good deal? Because it's not likely to work or if it doesn't work and you've given the guy the cash, you're not gonna see that cash again, you've just got a fancy paperweight. Another example would be an actual shop that specializes in film cameras and what you can do is you can get great uh, warranties uh, you can get returns policies and you're kind of protected you're probably going to pay maybe 10 to 20 percent more but it's probably worth it if you're going to spend over 100 pounds you want to know that you're going to get a product that's going to work um, has been tested by a professional 
And if it doesn't work, you're gonna get your money back. You can go elsewhere and you're gonna end up at the end of the day with the camera you want. The, the third option are uh, obviously eBay listings and that is gonna be its own chapter because there's a lot to look through there. But what I'm gonna talk about now is yeah, let's, let's briefly skip the kind of the Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace stuff for now, and let's talk about camera shops. Now, I'm gonna be doing this in a UK specific way, but if you live in the US, there are places like KEH that are essentially online camera retailers. They'll give you a lot of the same options, and obviously the price is a little bit higher, but you are protected by that guarantee refund area that the, obviously the camera stores specialize in. Now, one of the ones in the UK that I am really happy with, and I'm, I'm happy to use as an example, is uh, West Yorkshire cameras. Now, they are consistently uh, around the market price, and they're not one of those camera companies that kind of price gouges you. Um, if you think about camera shops in the UK, one's in London, because of their business rates and their rent, they're gonna be a lot more expensive. Actually, just quickly, this is a, um, this is an example from a camera store in London. I won't name them, I think that's a little bit mean, but if you wanna speculate about it in the comments, maybe I'll like the person that gets it right first. Look at these prices, I mean, that is 5,000 pounds for a Pentax setup. That is absolutely wild. This isn't a film lens, this is actually a Sigma 18 to 35 digital camera lens. If you look at that price, and then this price, that's the Amazon price, that's a cool 61 pounds cheaper to buy it new, so never trust those people. West Yorkshire are good, they are reputable, and I actually found this camera. It's not exactly the same as the one I'm holding, but it's similar enough, and you can see that the price is within a close margin. You know that that kind of thing is gonna be a reasonable deal, and that you do get a two week return period. They are gonna sort you out if it goes wrong. Okay, I think we should talk a little bit about the sketchier of the, the camera options. When you have things like Gumtree, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, you have to realize that you're not dealing with a sort of a store, you're dealing with some person of whatever shady origins who is just trying to offload a camera that they either don't want anymore, that they found in their parents' attic, that they just have maybe no photographic background with, they just see it as a way to make 15, 20, 100 dollars, and they're trying to put it online. Now, you can get good deals. I have actually bought some fairly expensive kit off Facebook Marketplace but you really have to know the person that you're buying from. You have to kind of make sure that they're either a photographer and that they've been using it, or maybe see their portfolio, know what they're doing. You don't just want to blindly buy anything off Facebook Marketplace. I am going to show you now a series of tests that you can do to make sure that the camera you're buying is in as good a, a working order as you can tell before you actually place some film in it. So let's cut to an overhead view. So I've got this Canon AE-1 to demonstrate just checking a used camera for condition, making sure everything works. First things first, I mean, obviously I know that this camera does work, but I'm gonna go at it as if I have never seen it before. You can open the battery door, that's a good first step, because if it's an electronically controlled camera, you're gonna need this to work. Sorry, this door is just a bit fiddly. Now, taking the battery out, you can inspect the terminals in the battery door. If you see any corrosion, that's not a good sign. If the battery itself looks deformed or if it has the corrosion on either terminal, that's not a good sign. But this one is fairly new, so I can put that back in and close that up. Now, this camera actually has a battery check feature. So if I put this to on and press this button here, it will make a beep. Okay, the frequency of the beep actually tells you how much charge it has. So this one is fairly fully charged, but that's a good sign because a new battery means it's probably been used recently and will be probably working as intended. Next step, I'm gonna remove the lens because a lot of the tests you wanna do just on the body and we're gonna do some on the lens at the end. So I'm gonna put the lens to one side and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start by just inspecting the body to make sure it hasn't got any dents, um, scratches, things that might allude to a more storied past. This one it has a few scratches on the bottom plate. I mean, those are probably all me and it seems like it's been well looked after. I can open the back door by lifting up here. And inside, I'm looking for rust, things like sort of gunked up, maybe some failed light seals. It all looks pretty good. Obviously, the best way to test that you're not gonna get light leaks is actually to shoot a roll of film. But when you're inspecting it in a shop or at a car boot sale, yard sale, stuff like that, you're not always gonna have that luxury. 
The shutter curtain itself is quite an important thing, so have a quick look and make sure that everything looks good. What you can do is fire off a frame and then slowly wind on. And at this point, what you're doing is you're making sure that the winder is smooth, that everything rotates as it should, and that the shutter curtain as it comes across looks in good condition and there's no pinprick holes or damage to the curtain itself. This all looks good. I'm afraid you can't really test this more without actually putting a roll of film in. So what I'm gonna do is fire off a few different shutter speeds. And in doing so, what I'm listening for is shutter lag, maybe interesting noises that I don't expect. So let's fire off a thousand. And then let's fire off a, obviously you could do every shutter speed, but just for the, the YouTube, I'm gonna go straight down to a 60th. I'm gonna rewind that. Fire off a 60th, that all sounds good. And as we keep going down, I'll fire off an eighth. And you can actually look through your shutter at the back and see that everything is opening and closing as you expect it to. So I've got to the point where I'm pretty confident about the condition of the body. I think that the shutters are good. I think that the, um, the condition of the, the interior is in good shape. What I'm gonna do is lastly check the meter and for that, I'm gonna to have to put the lens back on. When you put the lens on, set it to something that's reasonable for kind of shooting indoors. If you set it to 1000 F22, you're probably not gonna be able to tell if the meter works. If you're in the dark, it's just gonna stay underexposed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this to 160th at F5.6 at 400 ISO. And then what I'm gonna do is point it at a light source. Let's say I just use the torch on the iPhone. So I point it at the light source and I look through the viewfinder and if I see in the viewfinder that the meter changes when I point it at the light source and then away from the light source, I can be confident that it's responding to light, which is obviously a good sign. Whilst I got the torch out, I'm gonna show you a good way to test the condition of the lens. If I unmount this lens from the body, you'll see that it, it actually defaults to stop down. So that means that I can't quite inspect the front and rear elements without opening it up. Some cameras, you can actually press one of these levers and that will let you open the aperture. But you can't with the FD mount lenses. There is a workaround for this and all you have to do is remount the lens on the body, set your aperture to f1.8 and open the back. Now that I've got this set, I can put the shutter to bulb mode. And when I press the shutter, obviously I had to cock it again, I can hold it over the light and I can look at my front element through the back of the camera. And what I can see is, first of all, that it's incredibly dusty. That's fine, that's a lens wipe issue, that's not like an internal problem. But the main thing that I'm looking out for here are things like haze, fungus, or big scratches and dents to the front element. I'm have a look through, uh, it all looks good from here. Whilst you're doing this, what you can also do is close the shutter and just winding it again. Stop your aperture down to some different f-stops and make sure that it closes as expected. Now I've tested f1.8. I'm now gonna test the f5.6. As you can see, that's a little bit smaller than before. And now that I've done that, I'm gonna go all the way down, let's say f16. Again, rewind the shutter and fire that off and you can see that it's a much smaller aperture and that's all a good sign. You don't have to do the aperture through the back of the camera. What you can also do is looking at the front of the camera, just set it without filming and fire it off a few times and just look at the front and see if I put the torch behind you'll be able to see this. So let's just say F8 looks like that and F2.8 will look a little bit bigger it's all just a case of making sure that the commands that you give to the camera are being accepted by the lens. Um, obviously, if anything sticks or sounds delayed, you know that there might be some problem with the mechanisms inside the camera. Other than that, have a look at your aperture blades. Make sure there's no oil or stickiness on them. Maybe look through your viewfinder and make sure that's clean of dirt and dust. It can give you some peace of mind just to test the camera out. Most stores will be happy for you to have a play, have a look through it. As long as you don't look like you're about to break it and you can kind of tell them you're just testing it, it gives you a bit of peace of mind and is one of the main advantages of shopping in person. If you have tested the camera and it seems to be in good working condition, you should still always have in your mind the kind of 
the path and the option that you have if it does turn out to be a paperweight. If you're buying it, don't use cash or a, a direct bank transfer unless you can really trust the person. If you use PayPal, you can always do the kind of the, the, the scam uh, dispute thing, but you can't, if you hand over the cash and it turns out to be a dud, you're out of luck. So we have things like Facebook Marketplace and the, the Craigslist, so Gumtree, online marketplace things, but you can also have places like charity shops or I think Goodwill for people in the States, yard sales, car boot sales, where people are selling old kit. They're often really reasonably priced. You probably won't get the best kit because there are people that know what they're looking for. Unless you're the first person at the car boot sale, you're probably not gonna get a Leica for 50 pounds, but you do occasionally hear stories where people have walked into a charity shop and they found something like uh, Olympuses, um, actually this kind of thing. This Olympus, people could find these at charity shops for five pounds, 10 pounds, up until quite recently. But now that the price has gone up, people are aware of that. When you're at a car boot sale, you often will be speaking to someone or a charity shop. I mean, think of this as one umbrella term. You'll be speaking to people who don't know exactly what they've got, will be relatively familiar, but they won't know that it's a, a good one, a fancy one. It's unlikely to have a battery in it, and it's gonna be generally a bit more of a risk you can make your own mind up and you can think, um, for example, if you see one of these, they're selling for over hundred pounds now. So if you see one of these for anything under 20 pounds and it looks to be in good condition, you can pick it up and that's your risk. Essentially you're gambling on the low price of the camera. If it doesn't work, you've lost up to 20 pounds. But if you see something like a Leica for 500 pounds, I wouldn't touch it because obviously if it does work, you're gonna make some money, but if it doesn't work, you've made a huge investment and that's all gone down the drain. Um, it's all about taking as little risk as you can when you're trying to purchase stuff. So if you look at a camera and you see fungus, for example, I'd say that immediately rules it out for me. But if you look at a lens and it looks a little bit dusty, you look in the, the back and it seems like the shutter's all working and it just needs a little bit of a clean, a little bit of attention and it will shoot just as well as this for maybe 20 pounds, I'd go for it. It's up to you to choose the risk that you're willing to take, but it is possible to get good deals that way. Another type of shop that I'd say to avoid are shops that sell vintage items, but in quite a broad sense. If you go to a shop that has a couple of film cameras, maybe a typewriter, maybe some vintage clothes, it's not a camera shop and essentially what they're trying to do is get in on the um, the resurgence of film photography and just make a quick buck. They often won't really know what they've got. They won't have tested it and they won't really know the value of it. I see places near me in London. I live near Camden and there's a market stall that sells the vintage folders. Uh, they shoot 120 film, but they're really, really old bits of kit. And he tries to sell them for 50, 60 quid. And I assume if he's still there, people are buying them. But if you do that, it's, it's a bad idea. Um, stick to either camera shops or um, charity shops. Don't go for those ones that blur the lines and kind of sell a lot, but haven't really got a clue about it. If you are gonna get a, uh, a kind of a risky item, make sure you're getting it at a charity shop price, not at a vintage price, because obviously you're taking that risk. You wanna spend as little as possible on something that might not actually work. This video is getting quite long, so I'm gonna try and rattle through the last bits. We're gonna talk now about eBay, and eBay is obviously a fantastic place to get anything really. It's not specifically camera kit, but with cameras, there are some things to look out for. First of all, you have to look at the code words in the listing that might suggest that everything isn't as it seems. If you see the words collectible or prop or for parts, then it's probably not gonna give you the experience you want from it. If you look through the listing and you see things like tested or full working order, then you're safe because eBay is known to side with the buyer in most disputes. If you get the camera and it turns out that it's a pile of bricks, you can take a picture of it, send it back, and eBay will usually refund you the money you spent. You do hear those horror stories of people buying things and they try and buy like a chair and it turns out that it's for a doll's house and it's only this tall. But if you're trying to buy a camera and you see the word full working order, then I'd be fairly confident with that. The other thing to check is the, the feedback page for the actual seller. So we'll do an example now. Um, this is the example page of the Japanese seller that I saw selling the black AE1 about 10 minutes ago in the video. 
You can see this is pretty reputable. You can see the guy is selling quite a lot of equipment and he's having incredibly positive feedback. If you see things like that, you can be very confident and you'll notice that this seller has a returns policy. That kind of guarantee can make you feel pretty safe even in the kind of wild world of eBay. Another funny thing about eBay is that the people selling the cameras don't always know exactly what they're doing and they can make spelling mistakes in the name of the kit. And if you can find these, you can actually get some pretty good deals. A good example is with Hasselblad. Normally it's H-A-S-S-E-L, but some people spell it Hassel, H-A-S-S-L-E. If you search for Hasselblad, you can find these weird listings that essentially no one's gonna see because the people who are searching for the camera kit are gonna spell it correctly. They're not gonna see the stuff flying under the radar. I don't know if these prices are particularly good. I, I also found a Mamiya RB67. Obviously it's meant to be Mamiya. Um, that's not a particularly good deal. But I found this Nikon with two Ks, Nikon F3 for 95 pounds. And I've seen those sell for well north of 200. So that might actually be a really good deal. I'm not gonna go for it. This video is being released in early October, 2019. So if you see that and you want it, that actually might still be for sale. The last subcategory of eBay is the Japanese eBay market. You'll probably know this, but a lot of cameras are actually made in Japan and they have their own camera culture. There are great deals on a huge amount of kits coming out of Japan. So if you're looking for something a bit more niche or you're looking for something in real mint tip top quality, then Japanese eBay can be the place to look. One thing to be aware of when using international eBay are the customs duties that different governments can impose on imports to the country. I live in the UK, I bought a Pentax 6.7 from Japan and I had to pay about, I think 15%, 20% on the import at the point of receiving it. So instead of receiving the parcel with the camera in it, I actually got a note through the letterbox saying, you owe this much in customs duties. I paid that and a few days later, they sent me the camera. It actually sometimes works out that the price and the customs duties still works out cheaper. If you think about the listing we saw earlier, there was a 55 pound Canon AE1 with 40 pounds of postage from Japan. And that would equate to probably 60, maybe let's say 65 pounds after the, the customs tariff, and then uh, 102 pounds after the shipping is added onto that. That actually works out as a good deal, even considering that you're paying quite a big import tax. So do look into that. If you're looking for things more expensive, say uh, like a Mamiya 7 or a Hasselblad 500 series, don't get stung by that import duty because obviously once you've ordered it and it's pending in the postage, you have to pay that to release the item. So even if you want to return it, you're still going to have to pay the government to even be able to ship it back because of the fact that it's, um, it's not exempt from import duties. Whilst we're on the topic of the Japanese market, I thought I'd mention Japan Camera Hunter. This guy, Bellamy Hunter, is actually, uh, it's his job. What he does is he acts as a middleman between the international market and people who are looking to get the uh, get cameras, get equipment from Japan. He acts as a sort of man on the ground. He'll go to the shops and if you're looking for something niche, if you're looking for something specific and very top condition, what he can do is actually go into the shops. He can have an eyes on with the camera and you will pay a little bit more, but what you're paying for is that kind of security and customer services. Um, he also has a website where he sells some stuff, but if you are looking to um, essentially get the, the Japanese equipment without the hassle, then he's probably the guy to talk to. Obviously there will st still be import duties, but you can be a little bit more confident about the actual product if you use his services. Okay, that about wraps up the video. I know this one was super long, but it was one of those runaway threads that once I started, I just felt I had to finish the whole thing. If you've watched it this far, congratulations, and stay tuned. I think that my next video, maybe later this week, could be a review of this Olympus MJU. I haven't had this for long, it's, um, it's great fun. I don't even know if I should call it an MJU or a Muji or a Stylus Epic, but uh, that's on the cards, that could be a fun video. I've also got the Bronica ETRS but either way, it should be interesting and should also be shorter than this one. Thanks for watching.